We wish to show our appreciation to the people for making this picture possible. The film was photographed on the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah through the cooperation of the Navajo Indians and Navajo Agency employees, as well as Trader Lawrence Spalding, General Superintendent, Mr. Robert W. Young, Assistant Superintendent, Sam Akia, Chairman of the Navajo Council, and Howard Gorman, Chairman of Resources. The musical arrangement, the writing song, and the circle dance by Casting Music Company, Gallup, New Mexico. Mapped by the American Automobile Association. We hope you will enjoy Navajo Arts and Crafts. The Navajo Reservation has 15,087,163 acres, or 23,754 square miles, an area the size of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. It is a land ideally suited to the peculiar tradition of its inhabitants. The Navajo is inherently a nomad, accustomed to rough, rugged existence. Flanked by high mountains and dotted with lofty prominences, the weird beauty of the Navajo country in its many moods is breathtaking, awesome. Towering, magnificent Ponderosa pine forest plateaus. Expansive stretches of sparse grassland and always the ever-present panoramic grandeur of the stately monolith, standing like sentinels in the background. Crags and cliffs of varied bright hues, huge canyons hundreds of feet in rocks, the painted desert, here in a reckless mood dipping lavishly in its purples and pinks, nature has daubed an Indian paintbrush over nearly a hundred miles of territory, painting the sands and rocks in gorgeous hues, but leaving the country a barren wasteland. The reservation itself is very extensive and the physical conditions thereof are such that it is impossible for the Navajo to live in communities or villages. Wherever there is a spring or a piece of land that can be irrigated, some crop is planted. Corn, oats, wheat, or squash and melon. There the Navajo... His next neighbor may live within sight, or perhaps five or ten miles. Besides this dwelling, he may have another residence at the place where herds of sheep are grazed, and perhaps still a third home in the timber where he spends the winter with his family. Summer shelters are roughly constructed of a frame of poles covered with boughs of juniper, pinon, or sagebrush. These, as we can see, are of a strictly temporary nature, and, of course, there is no door to be locked or window to be secured. Although we look upon this as a rather primitive existence, we can easily see how the Navajo people, how, and how they are trustworthy as a nation, knowing that their possessions will be safe. Hogans are with mud, or sometimes a covering of brush is laid over a rough framework of poles and coated with mud, too. Many Navajos build log cabins of pine or aspen, and of modern construction containing doors and windows if these materials are procurable within hauling distance. One of the outstanding annual occasions across the country in many states and counties is the fair. So it is on the Navajo Reservation. And here the whole family loads up and trundles off to the Navajo Tribal Fair. All modes of travel can be seen as the covered wagon rumbles away. Horseback, reminiscent of the days of the Wild West, the open wagon, the horseless carriage of recent years, and then, of course, the most ancient of methods. Perhaps the only saddened creature on this gala day is Rover, who must stand guard at home. Here at the fair, most of the families come bag and baggage. And unlike the fares we are accustomed to, camp right on the grounds. Water for cooking and drinking must be carried through the bustling crowd to the family tent. Amidst what looks like a disorganized turmoil, families are getting settled for the next few days. As the cooking fires are fed, horses are tied, and the camp in general makes some order out of chaos. Special lots are designated on the fairgrounds for the wagon park, tenting area, and auto parking. As the visitors pour in, the pace quickens. One seems to sense an accentuated enthusiasm, pervading this, the biggest of Navajo celebration weeks. And now the time arrives for the official beginning of the fair. The scene is the huge oval racetrack. Every fair must have its funny man, and like our circus figure, the tribal fair has its clown, in this case, a mounted buffoon. 
One of the exciting sports of competition is made more spectacular on the wet, muddy earth as the calf roping contest gets underway. This is truly a contest of skill and dexterity as the rider lassos his animal and with lightning-like speed leaps to the ground and secures his rope in the specified manner. Little concern is given to the mud that flies, for this contestant is interested only in breaking that tying record. Along with this contest of skill, there are the Cowboys bareback watermelon race, too. Also, the relay and bicycle races, and of course, the men's Indian arrow game. All of these contests are enjoyed to the fullest by the crowd, just as they admire the entries in the show horse competition. This is a typical participant, a beautiful steed which is obviously the pride and joy of its owner. Just as in any large assemblage of people, one of the most interesting of pastimes is just watching the passing crowds. Thus we look in on the midway where humanity in great variety passes. Amidst the flurry and excitement of the day's proceedings, one essential hour cannot be overlooked, lunchtime. Quite like our sandwich bars where coffee, donuts, and pies are served, are these stations to provide food for those who have not planned to bring and cook their own. Then too, the feed bag is on for the horses who find theirs in a portable manger. The exhibits would not be complete if there were no examples of the famous Navajo rugs. This one is of particular interest, a good piece of the beautiful double weave variety. The result of this method is seen in this completely different designs on each side of the rug. This type of work naturally demands greater skill and time. The silversmiths, of course, show their wares in all of the numerous types of jewelry. Large showcases such as these display every conceivable form of silver handiwork, bracelets, rings, necklaces, pins, brooches, all handmade. The fair provides an excellent opportunity for the Navajo to show his handiwork and in these displays can be found beautiful articles of leather, hand-tooled and dyed by the skilled leather workers. These particular ones have been made by tuberculosis patients who use the money obtained through the sale of their work in the upkeep of the hospital. Another product of the Navajo's artistic endeavor are the beautiful bead creations. Just as in the case of the rugs, the artist creates his design as he progresses. Unlike some forms of art where a detailed plan is established prior to the construction, the art of making such delicately attractive pocketbooks and belts emerges as the piece develops. In a closer view, we can see this exquisite beauty of a blue ribbon winner. We might easily imagine the pride of the artisan whose work this is, if we compared it with a sculptor or painter who has just won a similar award. Comparable to what we might find in the Grange display halls are these attractive arrangements of the harvest bounty. Prize melons, squash, corn, hay, and preserves are selected by an entrant who will compete for quality and originality of display. All of us are reminded when we see this that agriculture is and probably will be for some time the basis of our economy. On the midway again, we notice the quiet type of observer who seems content with standing aside and passively enjoying the people about him. But more normally, there is the excited, fast-moving individual who hopes to, to see and enjoy as much of this autumn spectacle as he can within the short time. Little boys, grown men, grandmothers and young girls, all proud of their Navajo heritage, but at the same time unwilling to interfere with progress, a progress they know will include their welfare. And just as at our carnivals and fairs at home, this one would not be complete without the pleasurable and exciting rides of all types. The traditional Ferris wheel and even more daring rocket trips are to be enjoyed. Before witnessing a final event in the busy day, we might point out that the Navajo Tribal Fair was begun in 1938. From that small beginning, it has grown into a truly big enterprise, embodying almost all of the Navajo's activities. It aids the Indians' agricultural endeavor and remains the outstanding festival of the year, demonstrated in this final highlight, the Navajo Beauty Contest. The basic rule is that the ladies must be at least 16 years of age. Then they are judged on the beauty of their hair according to Navajo standards, and more important, the tribal costume they wear. Poise, personality, and physical attractiveness are included in the appraisal, but aren't the main factors. 
The crowd waits and watches as the judges call for each contestant in sequence. And under their calm exterior, each one of these young ladies is waiting breathlessly for the decision. The great $8 million Shiprock Boarding School. This ultra-modern school accommodates 1,200 students from grades 1 through 12. It is the city within itself, providing and performing the manifold services necessary for almost complete self-subsistence. Indeed, it is a far cry from some lonely canyon or the far-flung reaches of some timber slope. Here, progress provides the Indian with another great contrast. It is here, and in other similar schools, the Navajo is being trained and taught. How different these structures are from the century-old Hogan's and the Lonely Canyon homes. The Navajo now makes use of all the modern facilities found in perhaps just the newest of college campuses across the country. For indeed, this is quite like a campus, for here we see the dormitories, living quarters for all age groups. Special sections are provided for the youngest students, the intermediate age, and seniors. Then too, there are apartment houses where live the resident teachers and specialized employees. Another view of Shiprock School reveals the variety of construction methods and design. Second floor classrooms are elevated above motor traffic throughways, utilizing available space to its best advantage. Inside, too, we encounter a modern atmosphere. This is the cafeteria where 3,600 meals are served every day. Here at modern, very colored tables can be seated 400 students at a time. And with the efficient kitchen staff, three shifts at each meal are handled with professional skill. The automatic dishwashers and the bakery, which supplies eight other schools, are witness to the fact that dining is big business, but at the same time, self-sufficient at Shiprock. Of all the various types of schools, the trailer school is perhaps the most unique in that it is a system which takes the school to the pupils. At certain times of the year, when the family herds must take advantage of the remote grassland areas, so must the family move. It is a common sight out in the distant recesses of the Navajo Reservation to encounter these huge trailers. One is the mobile residence of the teacher, the other the classroom with a capacity of 25 pupils. Monument Valley is a never-never land which defies description. Its great volcanic and sandstone monoliths rising from the desert floor to heights of 2,000 feet are symbolic of Navajo land in many illustrations. Nowhere in the world can such unique grandeur be matched. The rich blending of the many tints of red, amber, rust, and gold can never truly be reproduced by the hands of man. We are reminded, however, that the Indian himself has done his utmost in reproduction of such color when we see the vibrant shades of the native rugs and hand-molded jewelry. Yes, this is Monument Valley, when all of its beauteous warmth is laid in contrast below a dome of cool blue sky, we detect another carefully planned balance in nature. Although Monument Valley, with its wondrous scenery and ancient heritage, seems to have lain rather dormant as the centuries have passed, we recognize at once that its inhabitants follow rather up-to-date practice. One of these practices exists in the form of the Navajo beauty shop. Women are women no matter what the culture. And here we see illustrated before us the reason why so many of the Indian women have beautiful clean black hair. The brush or comb being used is made of a local grass whose fiber is sufficiently stiff to provide excellent service to the customer as well as the beautician. Notice the dexterity of her hands in the preparation and tying of one of the traditional Navajo hairdos. And certainly, if the pleased look of her friend is any indication, we have the privilege of watching an expert. Might we be so bold to ask if the co-ed and teenager here at home and her myriad of pin curls could be so swift? The lands of the Navajo, though beautiful, are semi-desert and eroded by flash floods. Their productive value is low. Consequently, the flocks of sheep and the scattered cultivated tracts furnish only a precarious livelihood. Sheep raising has been the foundation of Navajo life since the Spanish imported sheep into the Southwest 
about 1600 A.D. The Navajo country is well suited to sheep raising, and the Indian has adjusted his life so perfectly to a shepherd's existence that we sometimes think of sheep raising as native to Navajo culture. Genuine Navajo rugs are made from wool produced by the Indians on their reservation. The wool is scoured and carded by hand, and it is spun with hand spindles. Often it is dyed with native vegetable dyes, then woven by hand on a simple vertical loom which is constructed by the Indian. Among the Navajo, weaving is done by the women, and they produce rugs on simple handmade looms which are set up near their hogans. To the Navajo weaver, rug design is visionary. She has no pattern to copy, and the designs are without significance or symbolic meaning. So as the rug maker gathers up her materials at the day's end, we observe the family in the distance bringing home their precious flock. An evening sun casts fluctuating shadows across barren, windswept sands as a mixed herd of sheep and goats hurries anxiously home to the safety of the fold. We wonder in a land so barren and dry as this just how the sheep find vegetation and water. The answer lies simply in search a continuous search which miraculously results in a fruitful existence. The Navajo's day is a long one, for in a land much of which produces a rather meager amount relative to its size, constant striving must be maintained. These people know unity, unity of family and unity of friends, but above all, a unity of purpose, and out of this emerges a loyalty and faith that unquestionably stands as the reason for their basic success and happiness. The mountain forests of Ponderosa are most beautiful in the contrast of winter. Nearly one-fourth of the Navajo reservation is woodland and forest. Ranging from the scrub growth of the lower levels, which is predominantly pinon, to the magnificent towering Ponderosa of the upper plateaus. Under the guidance of the United States Forest Service, which keeps foresters in the region at all times to supervise the forests and select the cuttings, the Navajo conducts a relatively large timbering and lumbering enterprise. It is a year-round activity. During the winter, the trees are felled and trimmed. Some of these men are skilled with the axe and the saw, but unfortunately, too many are indifferent laborers and remain only long enough to earn a few dollars. Despite color or nationality, the technique of felling a tree varies little the world over. The Navajo is no exception in that in any cooperative community, individual ability and preference determines largely the choice of jobs. The best axemen do the notching. Then the sawyers, either with old reliable crosscuts or the mechanical chainsaws, take over. Forest fire, lightning, lashing winds and insects, all are destructive to trees. This one bears a lightning scar. After trimming, every foot of these fine logs is carefully calculated by the scaler to determine the best grades and lengths for marketing. Modern machinery has been a boon to these loggers. Powerful caterpillar tractors skim with little effort through mud and snow of the winter forest, snaking the logs to the truck roads, where a crane loads them on heavy logging trucks. This equipment is operated entirely by Navajos, and as the picture indicates, considerable efficiency and good management prevails. The men hustle, for their rate of pay is determined by their production. A loaded truck moves away, just as an empty rolls in. Trader wheels telescope to the tractor and riding high. It requires only a tug of the cat, and the trader wheels drop back into place, and the trailer is ready for loading. Here again, Navajo ingenuity has asserted itself, to speed the return of the trucks over tortuous, winding mountain roads. The loading crane immediately moves into action. Two men, one for either end of the chain as it is dropped, secure the log. Then each grasps a loading rope, which has also been fastened to each end of the log, a foot or two from its end. As the crane lifts the log, the men guide its passage until it has been gently lowered to the truck. This procedure is repeated until the truck has received its load. Accidents are infrequent. Equipment is under constant inspection and is replaced when it becomes worn. The positive connection made by the spike in each of the logs, the loading ropes, plus the constant tension of the chain suspended from the crane, keep the workmen in relatively safe areas. 
When the load is completed, it is chained securely fast with the aid of the common boomers. Now the truck with its Navajo driver is ready to roll. There are a number of sawmills on the reservation. This load, however, is destined for Sawmill, Arizona, where the Navajos own and operate a large lumber yard. On arrival, the truckers pull into the unloading dock, which is built on the edge of the holding lake. Here, the logs are rolled from the truck into the water. This lake never freezes. By ingeniously piping the exhaust steam from the mill machinery into the lake, its temperature raised sufficiently to keep it constantly above freezing. Thus, through this bath, any ice and snow, as well as stones or soil, are removed from the log before it ever enters the mill. This sudden jumble of logs would present an insoluble problem to most of us. Not these Navajo workmen in their spiked boots. But this is more than a game of balance. These crewmen are detailed to keep the logs moving to the conveyor, and occasionally select a certain prime cut for specific purpose. From the lake, the log is guided into a mechanical carrier called a conveyor, which slowly carries it up the incline from the lake, down the last lap of its journey to the sawyer and his saw. The sawyer, just like the scaler, is a key man. His experience, the keenness of his eye, determines the efficiency of his cut, for it is his job to trim the log to realize the greatest amount of saleable lumber. The Navajo has equipped himself for his job. In these sheds, he stores all the machinery necessary to pro process the logs brought in from the mountains. In the kiln, which can be glimpsed in the background, such milled items as flooring and siding are dried. Various milling processes finally reduce that dripping log we saw a few minutes ago to planks and boards of various lengths and widths. From the mill, as they are sawed, they are placed on this slowly moving conveyor belt which carries them into the storage yard, where sorters stack them in piles of similar thickness and length. Thousands of logs are processed annually at Sawmill. Much of the lumber is used on the reservation, but large amounts are trucked to Gallup, where it is shipped to all parts of the country. Lumbering is the Navajo's biggest financial investment, and from it, thanks to the wealth of his timber resources, it should be a perpetual source of income. Annually, 15 million board feet of lumber are cut on the reservation, and sawmill contributes a considerable portion. The millwrights, sawyers, truckers, all the men connected with the mill at sawmill are well paid. Much of sawmill's success is due to the size of the mill, which is quite large and in daily operation. A constant supply of lumber is always available to the prospective purchasers. Thus, it is only natural that the best labor available would eventually find employment here. Well paid and prosperous, they are among the most dependable members of the tribe. The long-range planning of the United States National Forest Service will ensure forests like these for 75 years and permit, at the same time, an annual harvest in logs of 15 million board feet. Cutover areas, such as this, will grow into future forests, ensuring sawmill and other yards of an endless perpetual supply. Plaintive, melancholy echoes. Something in the bleating of sheep brings to mind vast, boundless solitudes. The Navajo country is like that. It is especially adapted to the raising of sheep and to the Navajo, peculiarly well fitted for his pastoral role, a coincidence which has placed him practically on a self-supporting basis. It is a fortunate coincidence. The lands of the Navajo, though beautiful, are semi-desert and eroded by flash floods. Their productive value is low. Consequently, the flocks of sheep and the scattered cultivated tracts furnish only a precarious livelihood. Shearing is done in the spring and fall with some care taken to postpone the spring shearing until the warmer months to avoid the storms. Skill and experience are prime requisites in performing a job like this. This type of shear is widely used too, although in certain areas machine type clippers are employed. After the fleece is removed, such odd pieces of value that may have been snipped off during the process are gathered and rolled inside. Weaving has been carried to a high degree of perfection by the Navajo. The Navajo rug today is the only thing of its kind in the world. 
The Indian Commissioner's Report of 1854 said, The Navajo are manufacturers of a superb quality of blankets that are waterproof, although made of coarser woolens. This quotation shows that more than 100 years ago, Navajo weaving was an object whose quality and artistic execution excited the attention and appeal to the aesthetic tastes of cultured and educated people. The Navajo learned the art of weaving from the Pueblos, and the Navajo genius discovered that the plants and minerals of their desert lands could be used to change the native white and black wool to a multitude of soft and lustrous colors. Blended on the upright loom, these produced the antique Navajo rugs, so much prized for their simplicity in design, which consists for the most part of variations of simple stripes in pale yellows, browns, grays, tans, and rose, which reflect the beauty of the desert. There is now a revival of interest among Navajo weavers in the use of vegetable dyes and the old blanket patterns originally used. Weaving has always been woman's traditional role, the gathering of the materials her complete responsibility. To the mountains in the nearby fall, she goes for mahogany roots. The mahogany tree, which really resembles a bush, grows from four feet to eight feet in height and is quite common in the mountains and foothills at elevations of 7,000 to 10,000 feet. It is not a deep-rooted plant. As you can see, a few well-aimed blows of the axe in this girl's hand soon digs it loose. The top of the plant is of no value to her, and a cut or two of the axe soon disposes of it. The roots, particularly the tap root, is her intent. In the early fall, its color is at its prime of deep, rich red. A few blows of the axe exposes it, and then more carefully she trims and discards various unwanted portions. Only patience and reasonable diligence are requisites to the job. As each root is trimmed, it is tossed aside, leaving a few pieces of deep red bark to be retained. The pile grows very slowly, and perhaps the laborer sighs frequently. But eventually, the task is completed and for her efforts she may have a handful or two of bark. One of the important phases in the preparation of the wool is, of course, the cleaning process. The only soap which the ancient Navajo knew was obtained from the two yucca soap, soap weeds. The roots of these yuccas contain the compound saponin and make an excellent soap, which is still preferred to the commercial article for washing wool. The leaves of the plant are of no value as soap but rather the thick root supplies the desired substance in abundance. Much practice enables this lady to extract the root with alacrity to dispense with another step in this rather long process. These girls are collecting stone lichens. These tiny flowerless plants grow on stones in the foothills of the southwest. They are easily scraped off after a rain loosens them and can be collected and stored since they can be used in either the fresh or dried state. The entire plant is used. By varying the amount of lichens and by making certain other recipe changes in her mixture, the Navajo woman understands how to produce numerous shades of orange and reddish tan. Strict utilitarian that he is, the Navajo has discovered a multitude of uses for even the humblest of his natural resources. The common sagebrush, always green, is used for medicine and forage, as well as dye. Low-grade raw alum, such as this colorfully dressed young lady is gathering, is fairly common in the flat reservation country. Certain other mordants are used in addition to the alum, such as juniper. The red root of the mahogany tree, the purplish-green sage, and the moss-like lichens these are only a few of the many, many plants the Navajo has utilized to produce his dyes. The list might well include every plant on the reservation. There are no textbooks, no lengthy lists describing the properties of these various plants. Neither does each mother give her daughter a carefully written recipe explaining the procedure. Instead, it is a knowledge gleaned by doing, such as the girls have been exposed to and will be exposed to. We have mentioned the common use of alum as a mordant. In the generations of his accumulated experience, 
the Navajo has acquired the knowledge of other mordants to attain specific results. Water from which the ashes of juniper has been strained is thought to produce more brilliant shades of red. It is a simple process. Sprigs of green juniper are ignited and allowed to burn to an ash over a skillet. Boiling water is added and the mixture, stirred thoroughly, is then strained. The strained water is ready to use as a mordant. The industrious worker in the background is grinding and pulverizing gypsum. Gypsum is found in small quantities in the shales associated with the coal deposits in New Mexico. The Navajo always knows where it can be obtained. The raw gypsum is toasted in a fire or baked in an oven until it turns white, after which it is ground to a fine powder between grinding stones. If one dissolves two tablespoons of this product in two cups of water for every pound of wool and rinses the wool in this mixture, it will produce a clean white yarn. It is absolutely necessary to wash the wool before dyeing if satisfactory results are desired. Here the yucca is being pulverized in preparation for the washing process. Repeated washings may be necessary if the wool is badly soiled. Thus a sufficient quantity of the crushed yucca must be available if the process is to be repeated. The crushed yucca is rubbed between the hands in cold water until a heavy lather is obtained. The mixture is strained and enough hot water added to make the solution warm. Then the yarn is immersed and washed thoroughly. When the yarn is clean it can be hung on bushes or trees to dry. In many cases, the Navajo simply spread it out on the hot sand. A hot fire must be maintained throughout the whole drying process. And as the others prepare the wool in the background, this woman starts the water boiling by placing the metal dye container on the hot stones adjacent to the coals, not directly over them. In carding, a handful of wool is placed between two wool cards with which the wool is combed until the hair all lies in one direction. The cards themselves are simply two hairbrush-like paddles, constructed of thin, rectangular pieces of wood, covered with leather and containing fine wire teeth. In the hands of an expert, these simple tools quickly accomplish the carding job. In spite of the fact that the Navajo observed the Mexican use of the spinning wheel, he insists on retaining the more primitive distaff and spindle. This spindle, consisting merely of a smooth stick and a whorl, or disc, placed about five inches up on one end, is stuck into a bunch of wool until it catches fast. While one hand spins the distaff, the other stretches out the wool into strands. These spun strands are wound around the spindle until it becomes too bulky to manage, at which time the strands are unwound into balls and put aside. In addition to washing the wool with the yucca soap, the weaver may want to bleach the wool still whiter. As we have already said, the ground-up gypsum powder is used for this purpose. Actually, it is more of a whiting agent rather than a bleach in that the pure gypsum powder coats the wool fibers thoroughly. After several soakings in the gypsum solution, the wool is laid out to dry and under the bright hot sun whitens quickly. The natural color of wool is akin to a creamy shade. With the use of gypsum, the weaver attains what is quite close to a pure white, thus adding another color to her selection without having to employ the complete dyeing process. The first major dye we are concerned with is the mahogany dye. This produces a soft reddish brown shade on up to a burnt orange color depending upon the specific type of additional dye used. The pure mahogany is what we see being prepared here. The root bark must be boiled for at least two hours and sometimes is left in the dye bath overnight to secure it more firmly in the fibers. Of course, as was indicated earlier, the juniper ashes and sometimes the powdered bark of the black alder are added to the mahogany solution to function as the mordant. We notice that a constant check is made during the dyeing of the yarn to see that there is an equal distribution of color throughout and that the different batches of yarn match in color as closely as possible. When the women have decided that the yarn in each case has reached its proper tint, they lift it from the container, wring the excess liquid out, and find any accessible place on which to hang it. In this case, it is a nearby pine. On the left is the resultant color of the lichen dye. Next to it, the cactus pear. 
followed by the sagebrush, and on the right the mahogany root, and with this the dyeing is complete. The first step in the actual weaving process is in the setting up of the loom. The frame consists of two upright posts, across which are lashed two horizontal bars. Within this frame, two movable bars are held by a spiral rope. The warp is wound up and down on this and made taut by the shortening of the spiral cord. This is the basic form upon which the weaver begins her work. She seats herself at the loom, and after some passage of time, we note the progress made on a typical design. The batten stick is used to separate the warp strands as the woman proceeds on the rug. Different colors of wool are brought to her from the storage house, and she is left to her own. She uses neither drawn nor painted patterns to guide her, but arranges her figures and designs in the process of her work. Since each color has a separate ball or skein of yarn, at times she may have more than a half a dozen yarns hanging down before her. If the weaving reaches a height which is not comfortable to reach, the spiral rope is loosened and the yard beam lowered. The bottom beam is reweighted and tied, and work is resumed. These are typical rugs produced by the weaving artists. A smooth blending of colors and rather formal lines is evident in this beautiful sample. In another rougher piece, we notice the skillful balance of angled forms with attractively contrasting shades. These two are colored with native vegetable dyes. Others utilize the commercial dyes, which, if used tastefully, can present a pleasing sight. Here we can observe the brighter tints obtainable in blue, for instance, in the more modern dyes. Finally, we denote this prized product of the loom, a rug many years old which has retained its identical shades from the day of its inception, a worthy testimony of a unique art. Probably no Native American handicraft is more widely admired than the silver jewelry of the Navajo. The Arizona and New Mexican Navajo have developed the craft of silver work to a high level and have become noted for their beautiful handmade jewelry. The art was learned originally from Mexican silversmiths, but the Indians have modified it to express their own artistic feeling for design, until it is essentially their own art. The most striking evidence of the affinity between the traditional Indian art and modern art forms can be seen in Indian silver work. While many pieces are made exclusively for the white man's use, their designs retain all the fundamental characteristics of the traditional tribal style. The Indian silversmiths all follow more or less a similar process. They use identical tools. They pound and anneal the silver in much the same manner, and use similar methods of setting stones. There is a difference among them in style, however. Navajo jewelry is usually rather heavy and massive. It is hand-hammered and stamped with dyes made by hand and distinctive in design. The first Navajo dyes were adapted from those used in Mexican jewelry. The stones are usually quite large in size. Cast jewelry, shaped in rock molds, is also made by the Navajo. And contrary to popular belief, the designs used are for decoration only and have no symbolic significance. In recent years, factory-made imitations of Indian silver jewelry have flooded the market and are to be found even in eastern cities. The buyer of a machine-made piece of silver jewelry should realize that it is a machine product one of perhaps hundreds that have been stamped out of sheet silver. Genuine Indian handmade silver jewelry may be obtained from the Indian Arts and Crafts Associations. In addition, the traders' stores located on the reservations, national park concessions, and leading gift shops throughout the country carry genuine Indian handmade jewelry. If you are interested in buying a genuine Indian handmade piece of silver jewelry, insist upon being shown something so labeled. To distinguish genuine Indian goods from spurious imitation, the Indian Arts and Craft Board, Department of the Interior, certifies authentic Indian enterprises, and these enterprises identify themselves by characteristic labels or designs. The Navajo silversmith is a comparatively modern product. As we can see in this artisan's work, the tools and implements used by the Navajo silversmiths are few and simple. An ordinary pair of tin snips cuts the sheet silver, 
which has been obtained either at the trading posts or through the guilds, then with a common hammer and a stylet or punch he creates his designs. The anvil may be of the ordinary type, or it might be simply a hard stone, a piece of iron from a plow, an axe blade, or even a pick head. In addition to hammering out pieces of all sizes and shapes, the Navajo also melts silver. This molten silver is cast into ingots. The molds in which the ingots are cast are made of sandstone, soft iron, wood, or even clay. They resemble as nearly as possible the article which is to be wrought. From such molds come many, many articles, such as beads or buttons of many shapes and sizes. Just as in the case of the Navajo's other artistry, he follows no prearranged plan. He seems to work somewhat on inspiration and evolves the consistent design in a spontaneous manner. Nor does he utilize symbolic figures depicting ritualistic thoughts or hidden meanings. For, contrary to common belief, he seems to make use of designs for their own sake. Our friend has hammered and finished the bracelets, following an acid dip and a process of blacking designed to throw the design into relief, plus a brilliant shine with emery paper, we view the finished product. The word Navajo in the trademark is our sign of its authenticity. In buying such beautiful articles as these, the prospective buyer is urged to look and ask for the genuine Navajo trademark for then he knows that he's getting the best quality handmade products. Imitations which are manufactured in mass production are certainly similar and may possess the same basic designs, but they will not have the hallmark of the true article. Thus we have seen the Navajo at work and at play. We have viewed his home, his school, and his government in action. Finally, we review the product of his handicraft. These, we think, are representative of the skill he displays in providing us with a unique standard of art. We, the citizens of the United States, can be proud that such a people reside within our national boundaries. For the Navajo, along with other tribes, is a reminder of the debt we owe to all of the ancient inhabitants in the founding of the greatest nation in the world. Narration by William R. McGraw and W. Paul Kaufman. Down by Byron Incorporated, Washington, D.C. Production supervision by Clifford L. Selkirk. This picture was produced and photographed by Homer A. Hot, Visa Films Incorporated, Holmesville, Ohio. The voice you hear is William R. McGraw. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah.